Conflict between parents can be devastating for children. While separating may relieve some of the things that people are arguing over, it's not uncommon for parents who are newly separated or divorced to find a whole new host of issues and challenges when it comes to navigating the co-parenting relationship. My guest here today is Carrie Beard, and she is the founder of Co-Parenting Solutions, located here in North Texas, where she helps parents every day approach the co-parenting relationship with new tools and resources to really help improve that relationship. Carrie, I'm so excited to have you here today. You are sort of the, the go-to expert in the realm of parental conflict and especially how to help resolve parental conflict. Oh, thank you so much, Jennifer, for the invitation. I look forward to being on your show. Well, I want to talk with you. I mean, co-parenting conflict is such a common experience for so many families. And I want to sort of just pull back from it and talk about what what is driving the conflict? What do you find when you're working with people who are really embroiled in, in conflict? Yeah, so I think part of the conflict comes from things that happened in the marriage that have been unresolved. Example, if you have trouble communicating in a marriage, guess what? You're going to have trouble communicating as co-parents. If there were anger issues in a marriage or lying, then you're going to have anger issues or, or honesty issues in the co-parenting. So until those core issues are really dealt with, with, and it's different for every co-parenting group that I deal with, you're still going to have situations that are acted out and conflict situations that arise. So you're telling me that divorce doesn't solve all the issues. Oh my goodness, <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't. You still have to work through those things. Or if you are the person who is who is irritated by those things, then you have to have a strategy to deal with it because they just don't change because someone is divorced. Okay, we're definitely gonna talk through some of those strategies. Okay. But before we do, I wanna talk about how important your work is because of the impact that conflict has on children. So let's talk a little bit about kind of what happens for a child when they're, when they're witnessing a lot of parental conflict. Oh, my heart just breaks a lot of times for kids because, you know, kids, Jennifer, they want to be able to love mom and they want to be able to love dad because they're, they're part mom and they're part dad. And so a lot of times kids get stuck in this loyalty bind that just grates on them. And sometimes we actually see kids who just to survive their parents' conflict get caught in living a compartmentalized life, meaning they, they have one one set of thoughts at moms, one set of thoughts at dads. I've had kids who tell one parent, hey, I want to play soccer, and the other one, hey, I want to play baseball, and they really mean it at that time. And at that point in time, Jennifer, my heart breaks for the kid because I want a kid who is going to be able to sit in my office and be an accurate reporter of their truth. Mm that maybe they don't want to play softball and they don't want to play soccer, they want to play the tuba. Good for that kid. But I want that kid to be able to say what they mean and both parents receive that. Mm -hmm. But that struggle that kids have in just being true or being able to honor what they really feel is one of the biggest things that I see with kids. Also, kids kids struggle with the conflict when parents can't deal with coaches and teachers mm. and doctors. Oh my gosh, these folks just want to be positive people in your kid's life. And a kid sits there with the knowledge that mom and dad can't get along with the teacher or the doctor or the coach. And that actually over time will close doors for that kid because people will step start to back away, not because of the kid, but because of what their parents are doing. Oh, I, it's horrible. And I don't want parents to be that parent. And one of the things I will do is to say, you have to change your strategy because you're on the road to becoming that parent. So I want to back up for a second because you just said something that I think is so important. And that is that the child needs to be able to know their own truth. And yes. when they're stuck in the loyalty bind, they're stuck in trying to please a parent or trying to tell a parent what they think that parent wants to hear, kind of out of a self-preservation. And they may even lose the ability to know their own truth. Yes, they do. Because when I talk to kids sometimes, I'm like, well, you told mom that you wanted to play soccer and dad, you wanted to play baseball. And they'll look at me and go, yeah, I, I mean it. Because 
and, and soccer means this to mom and soccer mm -hmm. means this to dad. So just to get along with the conflict, they actually become who they think the parent wants them to be at that moment. And that's horrible for a kid and is not sustainable. And so that, that, that might be one of the reasons why when parents come in saying, well, Johnny told me he wants to play soccer and the other parent isn't letting me play soccer. Like we can't be relying on what the children are telling us because, because they're put in the middle. Mm -hmm. And when, when I hear that, I think I sometimes surprise parents because I look right at them and go, I feel so sorry for your child. Mm -hmm. Because at this moment, it's not about soccer and baseball. It's because they're stuck. Mm -hmm. And part of your responsibility is greater than soccer and baseball. Your responsibility is to create an environment between the homes where the kid can be an accurate reporter of their truth. Of their truth. Of their truth. And that's there's really what we're going for. Nothing more important, I think, in life than to grow up and kind of know your truth. And I say that as a fifty, almost fifty-two-year-old woman who is, you know, still struggling with that. But that is really one it of is. the things is to know to be able to stand in your own truth is mm -hmm. is such an important um, a thing about being a functioning adult. Mm -hmm. um, okay. How do parents get here? Because nobody says, I really want to mess up my life or my child's life, and I want to make sure they're as miserable as possible. I mean, p parents are generally, I think, well-intentioned when it comes to their children. It's just the things that they're doing are so unhealthy for the kiddo. Mm -hmm. Well, I think some of it has to do with there are some core issues. Uh, Co-parents need to communicate. They need to learn to make decisions, not what they want, but what is in the best interest of the child. And my goodness, we argue about that sometimes because those two bleed over for some mm -hmm. people. But truly, what is in the best interest of this child and how we manage conflict? So many times when folks get to my office, I mean, folks get to my office not because things are going well. <laughs> We've got conflict. But here's the deal. A lot of that conflict over the years both of them have become reactive to the other versus one of the things I'm trying to teach people is how to be strategic, mm. not for your side, but for the child. And so I will tell people all the time, okay, I need you to speak to what you have heard the child say or what you believe, not bring your stuff over into it because sometimes people will project their thoughts and feelings about mm. their co-parent and they will present that in such a way that kids even feel the tension. I mean, you don't have to say anything, but it's the look. And sometimes I start people out with, I need you to say hello, hello, <laughs> not hello, but <laughs> hello. And then if you say anything else, I want it to be something positive about your kid. In fact, I'll tell you what I do in my office. My very first question, I think it irritates some people, is I'll say, okay, I need to know something about something that's positive in kid world. 30 seconds, a minute, let's go. And I do that because I want them to understand they've got a kid. And there needs to be positive things in kid world that is truly about the kid. And they need to tone down their anger and tone down their frustrations. And we, need, we don't need to ignore those frustrations, mm -hmm. but we need to have a strategic plan to deal with them. That's not reactive. Oh, okay. Um, so when you've got people that come into your office, you, you were saying usually it's not because they've been getting along great, but it's because they've been identified maybe through the legal system <laughs> that they've got, they, they're running some high conflict. What, what is your role and, and how do you begin to work with families? Then? Yeah. So as a parent facilitator, I'm trying to do two things. I'm trying to deal with presenting problems and those might be, what are we going to do with extracurricular? What are we going to do about doctors? Uh, how are we going to do exchange? Is, it's just kind of the, the working of being co-parents. Then I also have to deal with those core issues of communication and decision making and conflict because if I don't fix that and if we don't have a strategy for dealing with those things, then we're still going to have presenting problems because the broken core totally continues to fill those those life issues and life is going to continue to happen and this has got to be fixed and believe it or not we can get people to the point where if that's working folks will come into my office and go hey we dealt with it all in the waiting room <laughs> amazing you know and that that just that just warms my heart is it do you ever find because this is what i hear because i only represent one party yes. right is that um you know it's the other side who's making things so difficult mm -hmm. so you know i know that there certainly are patterns of you know 
behaviors and personality disorders that may factor in to these things, but how often, or, or how do you help parents navigate that when it, it, if it appears that it's one person who's more presenting as the problem? Yeah, so one of the things I will tell co-parents in an individual meeting, I want them to be heard. I want to hear what their frustrations are, but we cannot stay stuck there. We have to find a strategy to be able to go, okay, well, if this is the personality disorder or if this is the issue, then how do we have a strategy to move it into a more productive co-parenting and situation that's better for the child? So they just, they can choose to stay stuck Mm -hmm. and they'll be coming to my office for a while. Or we can choose to do something different and see if we can't get movement to where we can get some resolution of the tension, especially for the kids and secondarily for the parents. When we talk about kind of staying stuck, sometimes I wonder if all the the, it's very popular right now to label people. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's a borderline or a narcissist or whatever the label is, there's lots of information out there about the different disorders. How do you find that that labeling can either interfere or help maybe sometimes uh, parents navigate? I think some pe some parents are helped because that helps them to understand what they're dealing with. But I have to be very careful. You don't want to just throw a label out there. Yeah. Um, unless a person has received a diagnosis, at the end of the day, they're going to be co-parents and they, they have kids and that's the decision that just keeps on giving. And so they're going to have to navigate this together. Mm -hmm. And so whatever the diagnosis or the feeling or, or whatever it is, Again, there has to be a plan. And so many times they've been locked up in this sort of a conflict. And if I can get one person to do something different, sometimes that starts the path to resolve some things. But when you're stuck like that, you're just stuck. Yeah. So somebody has to do something different. Hopefully both of them do something different and then we can get to a better place. What do you find makes people stuck? I mean, I have my ideas, so I'm asking that, but like what, you know, when they get so entrenched and you just dig in your heels, what, what are we really fighting about? I mean, I think it's not the two, how we put the cap back on the toothpaste tube, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, whatever they're fighting about can take different forms, but in those moments when we've got people who are really entrenched, what do you find is kind of the underlying? It's issue? hatred of each other. Mm. It's need to control. It's need to be right. And it is also just the past conflict continuing to boil over into the present. And so it's not the, it's not the soccer. It's not which pediatrician. It's all of this. And it breaks my heart, but in any given week, I'll have to look at co-parents and say, you know what, if your child feels 5% of the tension that I'm feeling in the office and I choose to be here, then my heart breaks for your child. So sometimes when I can pull it down into, it's not about mom, it's not about dad, it's what this child is feeling. Sometimes I can get them to stop and go, okay, what is our child feeling? Yeah. And I will ask that as a follow-up. What is your child feeling? Because right now this isn't good. And you may tell me that you're trying to hide it, but your child who is half mom and half dad, they can feel that conflict. They can definitely feel their little mm -hmm. sponges. Um, all right, we're talking about strategies. So I know every family's different in mm -hmm. terms of like maybe the specific things they're arguing about. Are there some general strategies that you're able to sort of help people um, uh, learn to, to, to improve the parenting process? Sure. One of the first things I start off with is communication. Because if I can affect communication, then a lot of other things fall in place. Mm -hmm. And what I ask my clients to do is be very businesslike and professional in their communication. That means no yelling. That means no cussing. <laughs> that means no, hey, back seven years ago, you did this and I'm still mad. I want it to be businesslike professional, short, direct, and to the point, needs to be about the child, not the past and not their personal stuff. And it needs to be focused on a solution. And so a part of the protocol I use in my office is mom may share a concern, dad responds, 
I hold back and then I move them toward a solution. Everything has to be about a solution because if we're not doing that, we're staying stuck. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that impasse is, I mean, that it happens a lot. Mm -hmm. One phrase that I hear that comes up is parallel parenting. So mm -hmm. I'll either hear from a client of like, I figured out we just need to be, you know, parallel parenting, or my client will say, the other parents said they're going to do parallel parenting and that I'm not supposed to talk with them about anything. And so I wanted to get your professional opinion on what is parallel parenting? When is it the appropriate uh, tool in the toolbox, maybe? Um, or And what when do we avoid it, I guess? Yeah. So by strict definition, parallel parenting says there's mom's house, and she does her thing and makes her decisions. There's dad's house and he does his thing and makes his decision. And there's little to no communication in the middle. And I would say it doesn't, it's not really effective unless someone is sole. Okay. Because with in joint managing conservatorship, you have to be able to do a thin line. Notice I said thin line. When folks come to my office, I'm not trying for fluffy co-parenting because <laughs> most people go, oh, Carrie, we're not getting there. Now, some of them do, and that's really exciting. Yeah. But I'm first dealing with a narrow, narrow, thin line that says we have to be able to talk about health, education, scheduling, activities, kid business, keep our child out of the middle, and work well with other providers. Mm -hmm. That's the thin line. And if you're JMC, you have to be able to do the thin line. Right. I'm not talking about fluff. I'm just talking about thin line. And for my clients, a lot of times that helps them to go, Phew. okay, because they think they're just trying to sign up for fluff and they can't imagine getting there. No, I'm just trying for the thin line. Because the reality is parents have very different parenting styles yeah. and that kids actually benefit from having different parenting styles. It's one of the things I've... I learned to appreciate and raising my own children is, you know, where dad's much more the risk taker and the, you know, less uh -huh. rules and, you know, go for it. And I want to wrap them in bubble wrap that, that those different parenting styles are actually good for kids. Right. Yeah. And I also think there's differences that the, with the homes, there can be absolutes, things that we believe in wholeheartedly, like we want our ch children to do well in school mm -hmm. and, but how that's worked out, it can be separate. So there can be absolutes and house specifics. And I think that's helpful for people to realize. It is. And so when you're talking about the absolutes, is that those are things that both people have to be able to come to mm -hmm. in like of their own free will. They have to, it's not a coercion. It's no. a, no. yeah, this, I agree. Bedtime should be nine o'clock. Bedtime should be nine o'clock. Great. That's our agreement. We'll revisit it when the kiddo gets older. Yeah. No, a lot of times with absolutes in my office, it's more of an umbrella effect. We want kids to do well in school. We want our kids to be honest. We want our kids to be healthy. But then how that actually gets worked out, they can have a little different approaches. And it's really interesting. As I give people to have some different approaches to that, it sometimes calms some of the conflict down. And there's something I think I, that I notice, and I notice it in myself too, like I'm my own great you know, experiment um, that I, I study, but you know, that if somebody has a different perspective than I have, mm -hmm. that that somehow is intimidating and frightening that mm -hmm. oh, they have to be able to share the same perspective mm -hmm. or else I'm somehow invalidated. Mm -hmm. And it's just not the case. Like we can have very, very different perspectives and understandings of things and we could both be right. Like we don't mm -hmm. all have to have the exact same formula for how we're going to carry this out. Yeah. And even in a divorce situation, your, your, your child is going to get part of mom's personality and part of dad's personality. Hopefully they get the better parts of the personality and ooh, leave some more of them behind. But with that, they, like I've said before, they're part mom and part dad. And, you know, maybe, maybe dad does some things and really enjoys those things with the kids and mom does something else. And sometimes even in dealing with academics, I'm like, okay, who's good in math? Yeah. Who's good in English? <laughs> oh, we need to divide these things up. Yeah. And so I think there's a recognition, even as co-parents, that there are some things that co-parents do better than the other. And really to hold the vision for, for constructive co-parenting. I mean, what are your What's your definition of a healthy co-parenting relationship? I think a healthy co-parenting relationship can put their kids first, want their kids to grow, have goals for their kids. And I, in fact, every semester I have my co-parents share their goals. Mm -hmm. They don't have to agree, but we need to share our goals to know where the other one's coming from, to be able to communicate, to do the business of the kids. 
and put their kids in a position where they can grow and develop and be the be the kid that that the kid wants to be, but also that the parents want to invest. So we can get the kid to a place at 18. We we move them out of the house and onto adulthood well. I love that. There is an idea, this is this is a frequently asked question I get that at what age does the child get to decide where they want to live? People ask that all the time. And um, and, and I know there's there's been some changes in the law over that. What is your answer, not from a legal perspective, but from really from knowing and, and working with parents and working with children? I hate that question. And here's why. Because if you start to go down the road, then it immediately puts your child in the middle. And if there is, you don't want the ch child to be in the middle of legal conflict, because that's horrible for a child, because it just, it, it makes them feel like they're being torn mm -hmm. apart. And, but then number two, I think that if one of the parents are having issues with the child, we need to work through some therapy to work that out. Because a lot of times I'll explain to kids, if you don't work this out with your parent, do you really want to put them emotionally in a suitcase and take them with you to college? And they always go, <laughs> No. And I'm like, well, yes, that's what you're choosing to do. So we need to work it out. So I would prefer people to be focused on working it out. You know, I never can give people a legal advice and they can sure go talk to their attorney at any time. But let's don't put our kid in the middle if there's any way around it. I love it. And that's, it's so important. And I, I know I, even well-meaning people think that mm -hmm. they're doing the right thing because, you know, my child is now 15 and wants to live with me. And I, I just think when you're ha even having that conversation about which parent do you want to live with, we're, mm -hmm. we're putting the kid in the middle. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not about, I want to live in home, uh, home, home A or home B. It may be I'm in high school and I need all my stuff in one place. Yeah. So then sometimes I'm working with co-parents to go, how do we make this easier for the kid and their stuff? I love that conversation. Yeah. That's the best conversation. How it do is. we make this easier for the kid? Mm -hmm. What do you see in terms of like the, de the developmental, as children age, like how does parental conflict maybe shift or change from young children to, you know, elementary age? And then of course the beloved teenagers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? I think when kids are little, it starts off with sometimes we have a parent who's controlling. And with the co-parents that I work with, they both want to be involved. And, you know, well, sometimes every once in a while we have someone who steps out. But there needs to be this we. I talk, especially with co with co-parents of young kids, that there needs to be a we because the kids need to hear, I talked to your dad, I talked to your mom, and we have decided. Mm -hmm. If there can be that we and the kids can understand that even though they're not married, there's still a we when it comes to co-parenting, my goodness, that's going to make things easier when they're in junior high and high school. Amen. <laughs> because that kind of like, you know, shuts down a loophole. We don't want loopholes. <laughs> no. no, no, don't want loopholes. But then as a kid gets older, there's also the kid's thoughts. You know, I want to be at this birthday party. I want to go to this camp. So especially when kids are in junior high and high school, I have to help co-parents to understand, you know what? Your kid has a life. Yeah. And we have to work around that. Yeah. And we need to, we need to co-parent in a way in which our kids can follow their dreams. Right. And so it's not, it's not so much about my parenting time as it is about the child's time with each parent and kind of just shifting the, mm -hmm. the conversation a little bit around that. Yeah, especially if the kid's involved in extracurriculars, then let's face it, in Dallas, if you're going to play a sport, you're going to be in the band, you know, you're, you're going to be an actor, if you're going to be an artist, whatever that is, <laughs> there's stuff that you've got to be doing yeah. because there are paths to get there. And I tell every co-parent, hey, we want to put your kid in a, in a path where they can follow their dreams. And, you know, even in, in my own parenting relationship with my kiddos, I've just, I've noticed, I always have to step back and ask, is this my dream for my child mm -hmm. or is it their dream? And sometimes it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to wake up and go, yeah, that's really, it's really my dream. Mm -hmm. And to be able to let go and let them begin to forge their own path. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. It just is. 
What do you see in terms of, this is a big topic and we won't cover all of this, but just I, I, something else I'm hearing a lot of these days are allegations of parental alienation. Mm -hmm. And so what, um, what kind of behaviors contribute to a child rejecting another parent? Um, what should we do when we see that starting to happen? Absolutely, I draw a line in the sand that says if, if you're working with me, we have to stop the negative talk about the other. Mm. Just can't do it mm -mm. because they also, and, and that's even facial expressions. I was going to say, it doesn't even have to be words. It's just no. the contempt on the face. Yes, it can. Yeah. Because again, it's back to the child really loving the parent. And if they sense that the other parent hates the co-parent, then they're stuck in this, well, but I love my mom or I love my dad. Mm -hmm. And oh my gosh, they hate the other parent. And so I think sometimes, unfortunately, it breaks my heart that it's purposeful alienation. Mm -hmm. Other times, it's just, a, it's just a parent who needs to probably do some of their own work mm -hmm. to deal with their hatred and disappointment and anger of the past. Because as try as they might, they're not able to, uh, to stuff it and kind yeah. of fake it. And not even not even having the awareness of yeah. what the impact of that that eye roll, or mm -hmm. just that that very physiological response to somebody else being present. Or the, the kiddo, <laughs> <laughs> the big heavy sigh. Yes. <laughs> so if somebody wants to work with you, do they? Does it need to be through a court ordered parenting facilitation role? I know that we've tossed that around a little bit. We really haven't talked about the details of that role. Um, what uh, What are some other roles that? that you might play in working with family? Yeah, so with parent facilitation, it's either done by order or it's done by our rule 11 mm -hmm. between attorneys because we need to have something filed with the court. I will say as a part from parent facilitation, I also do co-parent counseling. Okay. And sometimes when folks aren't involved in the court process and they just need a little tune-up, are they wanting to be better co-parents, people will come to see me for co-parent counseling. Yeah. I also do therapy. I also, uh, and I do from adult all the way down to 10. And then I also do some substance abuse evaluations for the courts. Because I know a lot of times people will come after a divorce is finalized and, you know, they're thinking maybe I need to modify, but the issues that they're presenting are not really legal issues. Mm -hmm. They're really, they're really co-parenting issues. Yeah. And so to do that in a co-parenting relation, uh, counseling session, mm -hmm. does the other parent have to agree if they're going to do co-parenting counseling with you? Well, you know, I've even, I have therapy appointments with folks who uh, have a difficult co-parent and they come to me for some counseling, coaching. Oh, um, what do I do? Yeah. And so I uh, help them to deal with the situation as they present it to me. And again, I try to at first get them to be strategic. Yeah. Not reactive. And Sometimes we find by just changing one person's behavior, then that has an impact on the other. A very significant impact. And I, I think doing the coaching, if you can't get the other parent to agree mm -hmm. to come in and do counseling, at least get your own coaching. Because what I what I found is that our, our human nature, our natural mm -hmm. responses in situations are not always the best. And that if we can change that strategy, we can do it a little better. Absolutely. You were talking, we were talking a little bit beforehand, and you were talking about taking the the hook and that you you uh -huh. love fly fishing. So tell us <laughs> a little bit about how what, how that analogy works, because I think it's a great analogy. Oh my gosh, a few years ago, I love to fly fish. I'm standing in the middle of a pond and I'm watching this giant fish swim by and I'm like, why are you not taking the hook? <laughs> and I'm looking at my guy going, I want that one. He's like, well, he's smart enough. He's not taking the hook. And I went, oh my goodness. That's what I need to help people do is, you know, the, the the little bitty fish, they'll just take any hook and you catch them every time. And I always, when I catch one, I'll go, you need to get smarter because I need to catch you another <laughs> year to throw them back in. But you also, I tell folks, listen, you need to be like that wise fish that when your co-parent throws out a hook that has hooked you maybe every time for 10 years that you go, uh, he or she's doing it again. You look at that hook and you choose to swim on by. And I've got to ha tell you, once I have told several of my clients about that over the years, they will actually come back with a fly fishing <laughs> hook on their notebook and go, I'm listening. <laughs> and I'm like, 
don't take the hook because we just need to change our behavior from the past and do something different. Yeah. And then we get different results and yeah. the results that are, are so much better for the kids. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you see kids who are functioning well, um, out of a divorce scenario or out of a, you know, as parental separation is because the parents have figured out how to yeah. do it. Mm -hmm. For somebody right now who's watching us in this conversation and they're really feeling overwhelmed because they're in a very high conflict co-parenting relationship, what message of hope do you have for them? Well, there's always hope. And today can be different from yesterday and 10 years ago. And what you have to start doing is something for your kids you put them as you know what i want i want what's best for my kids i want them to be healthy happy and whole and you control what you can control and that is your attitudes actions and behavior and then you've also got to learn to be strategic not reactive and some of that, those things i think people can look at a situation and go Okay, that's what I need to do. Other times, you may need to get some professional help to help you to step back and go, okay, here's my strategy. But there's always hope. If there wasn't hope, I need to go do something else. <laughs> but the why that I do what I do is the families, when it works, and the kids come back and say something to me, of going, yeah, that was a rough chapter. But that's all it was, was a chapter. And my family got better. And now I can just love both of my co-parents. That's what we're going for. I love that. That is such a, a great message to end on. If you want to learn more about Carrie Beard, about the services that she offers through Co-Parenting Solutions, we're going to include a link to her website. I hope you'll check it out. And uh, thank you for, for watching today. Please subscribe and stay tuned for more videos that we're providing you with information about how to have a better, healthier family. And I uh, thank you so much for your wisdom today. Well, thank you, Jennifer. I've enjoyed being on the show. This I appreciate it. Thanks.